Welcome to the Radiology Review Podcast, your on-the-go source for radiology education with your host, Dr. Matt Covington, a board-certified radiologist. Please follow the podcast on Twitter at RadRevPodcast. Send emails to theradiologyreview at gmail.com or visit the website theradiologyreview.com. Welcome back to the Radiology Review Podcast, your free on-the-go source for radiology board review. This episode continues our discussion of the pediatric kidney. This episode will cover high-yield concepts for the ABR core exam in question and answer format, including many of the pediatric tumors that you need to know. As a reminder, you can follow the podcast on Instagram or Twitter at RadRevPodcast, where I am posting near-daily high-yield tips for the physics portion of the ABR core exam. And without further ado, let's get into the questions and answers for this episode. First question, what are key features differentiating grade 1 through grade 5 vesicoureteral reflux? Grade 1 vesicoureteral reflux may be characterized by reflux that is confined simply to the ureter, and on board exams I would expect they show you something like reflux halfway up the ureter, This ureter should be non-dilated, and again, reflux does not extend into the kidney. Grade 2 reflux would be reflux that does extend to the kidney, but is seen within a non-dilated renal collecting system. Grade 3 reflux is reflux to any level with a mildly dilated ureter and renal pelvis. Grade 4 reflux is reflux to any level with moderate tortuosity of the ureter and renal pelvis, and blunting of the renal fornices and papillary projections. Finally, grade 5 reflux is reflux to any level with marked tortuosity of the ureter and renal pelvis with expansion of the renal pelvis to the level that you have loss of renal fornices and papillary projections. Note that the most common cause of vesicoureteral reflux is abnormal insertion of the ureter at the ureterovesicular junction The normal insertion of the ureter in the bladder needs to be at an oblique angle to create a valve mechanism. About half of kids with recurrent UTIs will have an abnormal insertion of the ureter into the bladder. Chronic vesicoureteral reflux can lead to impaired renal function, which is termed reflux nephropathy and hypertension. Next question. What are the approximate odds that different grades of reflux will resolve without intervention? Grade 1 and grade 2 reflux typically will resolve without intervention in something like 80 to 90% of cases. Grade 3 reflux may resolve about half of the time without intervention. Grade 4 and 5 reflux will resolve in only the minority of cases, maybe something like 25% will self-resolve. Antibiotic prophylaxis may be considered for all grades of reflux, and surgical intervention may be considered primarily for grade 4 or 5 reflux, or for patients who experience breakthrough infections and or progressive reflux nephropathy. Next question. What structure does the urachus become after undergoing physiologic atrophy? The answer is that the urachus becomes the median umbilical ligament. Next. If the urachus fails to obliterate, what are the spectrum of findings that can result from a fully or partially patent urachus? Complete failure of the urachus to atrophy results in a patent urachus from the bladder to the umbilicus and presents with urine leakage from the umbilicus in a neonate. A partially patent urachus can end up as a urachal sinus if the patent aspect is at the umbilical end, or a vesicoureteral diverticulum if the patent aspect is at the bladder. If the patent portion is isolated mostly to the middle of the urachus, this is termed a urachal cyst. Next, what cancer is most likely to develop in a patent urachal tract? The answer I am looking for here is adenocarcinoma. Adenocarcinoma is the top cancer that can develop in a patent urachal tract later in life. Next, what are key features of nephroblastomatosis? 
Nephroblastomatosis occurs when nephrogenic rests persist beyond 36 weeks. Nephrogenic rests are persistent embryonal cells in the kidney that normally regress by birth. On imaging, nephroblastomatosis looks like homogeneous round masses and or a kidney with a hypodense rind. Please look up images of nephroblastomatosis if you are not familiar with the imaging appearance of this entity because it is high yield for the ABR core exam. A key feature to remember is that nephroblastomatosis occurs when nephrogenic rests persist beyond 36 weeks. Next, nephroblastomatosis is most likely to be a precursor for which tumor? Nephroblastomatosis is commonly considered a precursor for Wilms tumor. In cases of bilateral Wilms tumors, these almost always started as nephroblastomatosis. To screen for Wilms tumor in a patient with nephroblastomatosis, you can perform serial ultrasound or MRI for screening. Importantly, if you see any necrosis in an area of nephroblastomatosis, this is concerning for Wilms tumor and not regression of nephroblastomatosis. Next, what is the most common solid renal tumor of infancy and what is the most common solid renal tumor of childhood? The most common solid renal tumor of infancy is mesoblastic nephroma, and nearly all of these patients will present within the first month of life. This is considered to be a generally benign tumor, similar to a fetal hamartoma. The top solid renal tumor of childhood is a Wilms tumor, Remember that Wilms tumors typically do not present in infancy. On board exams, if you see a large solid renal tumor in a neonate, think mesoblastic nephroma. Next question. What are key features of multicystic dysplastic kidney? Key features to keep in mind for board exams are that multicystic dysplastic kidney has no functioning renal tissue, which means that the involved kidney cannot excrete urine. So one way to diagnose this entity if you are having a hard time distinguishing between hydronephrosis versus the dilated cystic spaces of multicystic dysplastic kidney is to do renal scintigraphy such as a MAG3 study, and if you see excretion of radiotracer into the ureters and bladder, this is not multicystic dysplastic kidney. With multicystic dysplastic kidney, you have multiple cysts that form in utero instead of the normal renal tissue, and the kidney will simply demonstrate a multicystic appearance. Remember that there is about a 50% rate of a contralateral renal anomaly in the setting of multicystic dysplastic kidney, and the top contralateral renal anomaly is ureteral pelvic junction obstruction. Next question. What are key features of Wilms tumor in terms of the age of presentation and top sites of metastatic disease? First of all, remember that on board exams, Wilms tumor will not present in neonates, but is a tumor of childhood with an average age of presentation of about three to four years old. Wilms tumor is a solid renal tumor that can spread by direct invasion or metastasize and the number one site of metastasis in the setting of Wilms tumor is the lungs, and the number two site is the liver. Next question. For the ABR core exam, what are some key associations with Wilms tumor? The first association I think you should keep in mind is Beckwith-Wiedemann syndrome, Wilms tumor and Beckwith-Wiedemann syndrome. Beckwith-Wiedemann syndrome has a lot of associations and key features, but these include Wilms tumor, omphalocele, hepatoblastoma, macroglossia, hemihypertrophy, cardiac anomalies, and organ enlargement, including enlargement of the liver, spleen, and kidney. In terms of tumors, Beckwith-Wiedemann syndrome has a common association with both Wilms tumor and neuroblastoma. We will talk shortly about how to differentiate Wilms tumor from a neuroblastoma. 
Also, I would remember Wagger syndrome, W-A-G-R. Wagger syndrome is commonly tested on the ABR core exam. Wagger syndrome comprises Wilms tumor for W, aniridia for A, genitourinary anomalies for G, and mental retardation or impairment for R. Finally, also keep in mind DRASH or Dennis DRASH syndrome. That is D E N Y S D R A S H, Dennis DRASH syndrome, in which you can see Wilms tumor along with male pseudohermaphroditism, in which an individual will have a 46 XY karyotype but has partial androgen insensitivity causing female phenotypic features as well as progressive glomerulonephritis. There are certainly other associations with Wilms tumor, but for now we have covered Beckwith-Wiedemann syndrome, Wagger syndrome, and Drash or Dennis Drash syndrome. Next question, what are key features of clear cell sarcoma of the kidney? First of all, a key feature of clear cell sarcoma of the kidney is simply that this is a very rare tumor, However, despite being rare, it is still the second most common malignant tumor of the kidney in childhood. If you are being tested on clear cell sarcoma of the kidney, it is important to remember that this generally has a worse prognosis than a classic Wilms tumor, can present with a palpable abdominal mass, and, this is very important, has a high propensity to metastasize to the bones. I would absolutely remember the association of clear cell sarcoma of the kidney and osseous metastatic disease. Next question. What are key features of cystic nephromas on imaging, and at which age is this entity most likely to present? Cystic nephromas, previously termed multilocular cystic nephroma, classically presents with fluid-filled locules surrounded by a thick, fibrous capsule that can protrude into the renal pelvis. Cystic nephromas characteristically do not have solid components, calcifications, or necrosis. Cystic nephromas were previously termed multilocular cystic nephroma, and multilocular cystic nephroma was thought to have a bimodal age presentation consisting of presentation in young boys and middle-aged women. However, we now know from genetic and histological testing that these are actually different entities, but on imaging they do appear similar. Pediatric cystic nephroma is most common in young childhood and boys. Adult cystic nephroma is more common in women around 40 to 50 years of age. Next question. What is the key imaging appearance of the botryoid variant of rhabdomyosarcoma of the bladder? And botryoid is B-O-T-R-Y-O-I-D. What is the key imaging appearance of the botryoid variant of rhabdomyosarcoma of the bladder? The botryoid variant of bladder rhabdomyosarcoma is highly polypoid and looks like a bunch of grapes, so that is the key imaging feature I would remember. Botryoid rhabdomyosarcoma and bunch of grapes appearance. Classic rhabdomyosarcoma of the bladder, on the other hand, is a highly infiltrative mass that can present as a paratesticular mass. Rhabdomyosarcoma is the top bladder cancer in young children and unfortunately often metastasizes to the lung, lymph nodes, and bone. Next and final question for this episode. What are key features that can help you differentiate between neuroblastoma and Wilms tumor? Neuroblastoma is the most common extracranial solid malignancy of childhood and can present at birth or otherwise typically in very young children. Wilms tumor classically presents in a slightly older population of children and is said to almost never present before age two months. So if you are presented with a question asking about a solid renal mass in a neonate, the answer is likely to be neuroblastoma. Calcification is very common for neuroblastoma and very rare for Wilms tumor. Also, Wilms tumors often are circumscribed, whereas neuroblastomas are often infiltrative lesions. If you see vascular invasion, 
this favors Wilms tumor. Neuroblastomas more commonly metastasize to bones than Wilms tumor, with the exception of the clear cell variant of Wilms tumor that we discussed. And remember that an MIBG scan is often the imaging modality of choice to evaluate for bone metastases in the setting of neuroblastoma. A few additional features of neuroblastoma need to be mentioned, as they are high yield for board exams. Raccoon eyes can be a sign of orbital neuroblastoma, and you need to know what this looks like, including the proptosis and periorbital bruising. You also should be aware of blueberry muffin syndrome, in which a pediatric patient will present with multiple blue or purplish lesions of the skin, and that is related to extramedullary hematopoiesis in the setting of neuroblastoma and other entities including CMV infection and AML. Additionally, you need to be aware of stage 4S neuroblastoma because despite having metastatic disease, this actually has a fairly good prognosis and presents in a child often less than one year of age with a thoracic primary neuroblastoma with skin, liver, and bone marrow metastases. Neuroblastomas can arise most commonly from the adrenal glands, but can be seen anywhere along the sympathetic chain. That is enough for now. I hope this information is helpful for you. I will make a free downloadable study guide on this topic covering both episodes 1 and 2 on the pediatric kidney that you can download for free on my website, www.theradiologyreview.com. Keep up the good work. Study hard. Remember, you have to study really hard to succeed on radiology board exams. So prepare to succeed. I will catch you on the next episode. Content of this podcast is provided for informal educational purposes only for radiology trainees and radiologists. Medical practitioners, please make your own independent assessment before suggesting a diagnosis or recommending any course of treatment. This podcast should not be used for self-diagnosis or self-treatment and is not a substitute for independent professional medical care. Please consult your own physician regarding any diagnosis, imaging interpretation, or course of treatment.